Thanks, Matt, and welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and thanks for the opportunity to chat today about what we've done in Ottawa. Um, I'm sure that many organizations are the same as in Ottawa, which is sport came to a grinding halt in March and um, the whole thought about how are we going to get back to play. Um, so what I wanted to take you through today was a bit about what we did in Ottawa and the project that we took on to um, get our very vital sector of sport back into um, play and support them. Um, Matt asked me today to talk about uh, my experience regarding COVID-19 on community sport and um, on the members in our community and, and how we um, were able to um, navigate it and how we're supporting people as we go along. Um, I wanna share the approach that we use because um, we decided that the Ottawa Sport Council setting the approach wasn't actually the right thing to do. Really having our members involved in setting that approach was the right thing to do. So we, we took a different approach than we have done in the past um, and involved um, very many of our members in doing it. So I just wanted to share that with you today. Um, and uh, our goal out of all of this is to ensure that sports not only able to survive, but it's also able to thrive um, post COVID and um, take you through the things that we're doing. And then at the end, as Matt said, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions, talk about our experience. Um, you know, if I can support you in any way, very happy to do that as well. Um, before I do that, let me tell you a bit about the Ottawa Sport Council. Um, the Ottawa Sport Council acts as the voice of sport in Ottawa. And um, we really facilitate advocacy and growth for all of our sporting organizations in Ottawa. So there are about 750 community sporting organizations. <clears throat> As an organization, we believe that there should only be positive experiences in sport. And that's pretty much what our vision is. Um, and what we try to do is do anything that we possibly can um, to ensure that anybody involved in sport, be they a coach, a participant, um, a, an official, um, an organizer, or even a parent um, has a positive experience in sport. We also really believe in the power of sport to motivate and empower youth and adults alike. So um, really believe in inclusivity in sport and the fact that sport should be available to all, um, regardless of any barriers that might exist, be they uh, disability for a physical reason, an intellectual reason, or a financial reason as well. We really do three things in Ottawa um, to empower sport. The first thing is we educate, the second thing is we advocate, and the third thing is that we give. In terms of education, that's where we spend about 70% of our time um, creating different education courses for um, educational offerings for our members um, to help them um, basically do their business better. We advocate on behalf of our members to all levels of government, um, specifically at the municipal level, but also at the, the provincial level and the federal level as well. And then finally, we've had the opportunity to set up our own endowment fund um, that we give out grants, um, two grants every year to community sport organizations who want to improve inclusivity in sport. So definitely our main thrust is education, then advocacy, and then our endowment fund. And that's pretty much um, representative of what our members' needs are. We, all of our actions are guided by the belief that sport should be ethical, inclusive, innovative, and respectful at all times. So again, going back to that, there should only be positive experiences in sport. <clears throat> the impacts of COVID, um, like all sectors, um, sport has been hit really, really hard by COVID. And I'm sure that none of these stats on this, um, this infographic will come as a surprise to you. Um, the Sport for Life took on this survey back in June to understand from community sport organizations what impact COVID was having on them, had had on them in, in the, you know, the early time and what it was continuing to have on them. And, you know, the stats on this infographic um, tell the picture and tell the picture really across Canada. I don't know that in any um, city, municipality, province that it's any different. Um, you know, the fact that normal competition can't go back. The fact that in many cases, the sport can't even go back because of physical distancing requirements. So obviously that's really hit hard. And when you add to it, the fact that so many community sport organizations across Canada, in fact, 75% of them are run by volunteers. Um, it becomes more of a challenge because this isn't a lot of people's day jobs as I'm sure a lot of you understand. And so they're trying to figure out their own day life and their own job while trying to keep their community sport organization 
aviation afloat. So some of the stats are the percentage that um, have been impacted by COVID, 99%, um, and, and the fact that you know 38% of them won't last more than six months without financial support. Sport for Life is considering running another survey now that we're six months in. Um, a number of community sport organizations have expressed fatigue with surveys, so they're not too sure if they're going to do that, but they're really using these, um, these stats to paint a picture up to the federal level to say this is a sector that needs support because as you all know, there's not a lot of support at the federal level for community sport organizations, and yet that's where sport really lives down at that community level. So I'm sure that you all know why sport's important. I often use this um, slide when I'm talking about the importance of sport in community. Um, Nelson Mandela's words say it so good, um, so well, that sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire, the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. It create hope where there once was despair, and it's more powerful than governments in creating and breaking down barriers. When I'm asked by any level of government or a sector outside of sport, why should we be supporting sport? This is a slide that I often refer to because so many people don't realize the impact that community sport has on a community. They don't understand the how a community sport organization can build community by integrating new Canadians into their fold. They don't understand how sport can be used as a deterrent to social justice. So um, it's, Oftentimes people at the community level understand it, but they find it difficult to get that message across. So we use this in the Auto Sport Council as our raison d'etre, or if you follow Simon Sinek, it's our why. Why do we do what we do? And it's something that we always keep top of mind um, because at the end of the day, this is all about our community and building our community. So in terms of what happened to Ottawa community sport in COVID-19, we look at it as three time frames. The first time frame was the survive time frame. That was the March, April, May, where everything shut down. Um, all of our organizations, our, our winter organizations, they were coming to an end anyways, but many of our summer organizations should have been starting in, in April and May. And they obviously couldn't start, they couldn't take registration, or if they had taken registration, they weren't going to be able to keep their registration fees because in many cases, they weren't going to be able to put players into the field of play. The second phase is what we're calling the return to play phase. And that was basically June 2020 when the Ontario provincial government said, you can go back to some sort of play. And we're saying that that um, second time frame is really going to exist until vaccine availability. Um, Matt and I were talking before I started about the whole um, increase in cases in Ottawa, we're seeing a huge surge right now. So right now, all of our community sport organizations are once again worrying about, okay, are they going to get pulled off the field? What's going to happen? And I think we're going to continue to see these blips until we do have a vaccine available. And then last is what we're calling sport post-pandemic, post-vaccine. Now, a lot of people are saying we're going to go back to sport as we knew it before. I really question whether we'll go back to sport as we knew it before. I'm really hoping it's going to be a better sport um, that's going to be more equitable and more inclusive because we've actually got the opportunity right now to um, sit back, look at the things that weren't going well, improve those, and really also um, capitalize on the things that were going well. As I said, um, our environment's like no other, like every other environment across Canada. Um, we have many, many volunteer run organizations, and we're now putting a burden on those volunteer run organizations. Um, not only do they have to put participants into the field of play, but they also have to look at additional health, safety, and liability requirements that they didn't have to look at before. So the big question is how to survive and thrive. Um, for these organizations. And the big question for the Ottawa Sport Council was how could we support them as they were going through this? And how can we continue to support them until we get to that third phase of sport post-pandemic? 
The first thing that we did was created a series of resources and the resources were really um, targeted at that first April, May, June timeframe. So um, talked about all the federal government resources, um, the CERB, the CEWS, um, the, the CEBA, the, the loan that um, organizations could get. Um, and we documented all of those and put them into one, um, one section on our website. Um, as I, I've put our website here, sportottawa.ca, and you can go to those. Those resources aren't unique to Ottawa. Um, what we really felt though was putting everything together on one page along with links to webinars was very helpful because it just meant one-stop shopping for, for our organizations. It meant that they weren't looking everywhere for specific information. So that was the first thing that we did to support them. What we did next was we actually um, went out to our sport organizations and said, how can we support you further? And um, in order to do that, we put together a leadership group um, that helped us define four different areas that we could help our community sport organizations. The first was the creation of a re return to play roadmap. Um, the second was helping with specific things with regards to risk management. The third one was looking at financial sustainability. And the last thing was looking at the communications. How were we gonna get all this information out there? We had a leadership group of about 15 people and we all thought that it was good to get the community involved. So we took this model out to our community. We called it the return to play model. And um, we asked if we would, if there were people who would like to get involved with us. Um, never in a million years did we um, anticipate the uptake that we got. We actually had over 70 organizations come to us and say, want to be involved with this, want to help. So what we ended up doing was dividing the people on their, their basis of preference into one of the four different subcommittees. And what we found was we were actually creating something that was for Ottawa Community Sport, but it was actually developed by Ottawa Community Sport, um, which was really important because it was the people who knew what the challenges that they were having, looking for solutions as opposed to us um, kind of being on the outside and, and trying to marry all those requirements into a solution. Out of that, we created the roadmap. So this also is on our website. Um, you'll see we, we did it in the, the, the style of a roadmap because we thought, okay, somebody could start at the very beginning and they can walk through the roadmap. So sport specific guidelines cover things like, what is your NSO saying? What is your PSO saying? Um, what, are the, what are your different municipality organizations saying? Then the next thing you have to look at is what you have to do an assessment of your risk. Then once you've assessed your risk, you've got to look at how do you manage that risk and what are the legal things that you should be looking at? From there, what are the health and safety measures that your public health administration is telling you? Um, how do you set up your physical environment to make sure that you're looking at physical distancing and you're looking at sanitation? Um, how do we keep these leagues sustainable and affordable? And then lastly, how do we communicate all of this messaging out to our participants? We then found that we had a whole bunch of different things that didn't fit into any of these categories. So we put a did you know category down at the bottom of the roadmap. The way the roadmap works is you can start at the beginning and follow along on the stops, or you can actually just click on a specific spot, spot if that's what you're interested in. And in looking at the stats, what we found is most people that come in, they follow the roadmap through the first time, but when they come back, they're usually looking for specific guidance on one or two areas um, in terms of, you know, uh, today I'm looking to health and safety because it's an issue that I've got to deal with. Most of the content on the website um, is, is best practice information from all over the world. So we didn't develop a lot of the content. What we did was we did a curation of the content that was out there already. And we, we pointed to, linked to, pointed to, downloaded the best information that was there, be it from um, Ottawa, be it from the province, be it across Canada or in other places in the world. So New Zealand was leading in a lot of the work that they did for Return to Play, New Zealand and Australia. So we've got links to their information. We've got links to what's going on in the UK. Um, where we did create specific information um, in the risk management and legal sector section. So we actually created um, uh, participant screening tools. We created um, uh, sign-in sheets. We created liability waivers. So all of those are on that risk management and legal. Again, as I said about the resources, they are not um, specific to Ottawa um, and they're available for download for it by any organization that wants to do it. Our view about all of this is that 
um, we have had so much support and help from across the country and let alone across the world that if we can provide that back by the work that we've done, we're very happy to share. So we learned a lot from this exercise. Um, we found that the roadmap has been really, really well received by the sector. Um, we have a contact us page on the roadmap and through that contact us page, we've had both a number of requests for support, but also a provision of a lot of new resources. So people will say, you know, I came across this resource. I think it's something you should be including. But what we have found is that promotion is key to ensure that engagement's high. And like many of our members, we are lean and mean on staffing, and it's an area that we feel that we need to um, give more resources to. So we're actually um, starting up a phase two of the roadmap, and we're going to assign more resources to the communication section so that we're out there telling people about specifically what the roadmap's about and how they can use it. The other thing that we learned when we were developing the roadmap was that just in time trumps perfection. So at first, um, our roadmap team that was putting it together really wanted all of the information to be together before we published it. But what we found was as COVID was changing, the information was changing and more and more information was becoming available. And so what we decided was we had to put a stake in the ground at one point in time and put the information on the website, even though everything wasn't there and even though it wasn't perfect. And so it's a living, breathing document that we continue to add to. And in some cases where information has come out that um, has superseded previous information we're taking off the old information so in doing that we had we realized the requirement that we had to both curate and we had to develop our own resources so you know it was the curation of resources in a lot of cases um, you know there was something that five different people had published five different ways of doing a specific thing, what we would do is we would look to find the one that was most applicable to Ottawa and only use one. Because again, we didn't want to overwhelm our volunteers and what they wanted to do. And as I said, where there weren't specific resources that we felt were necessary, we developed those. As I said, this is a living, breathing document. It's an ongoing project. Um, that's going to be necessary to ensure the relevance of the roadmap, and especially given, you know, who knows when the vaccine is going to be out there. We anticipate this is a project that's going to continue until we get into that post-pandemic phase um, because there's always going to be new support that's required. So as COVID evolves, you know, the resource requirements are still continuing to evolve. And so funding is very critical to ensure that we can develop the new resources. Um, what we've done to ensure that funding is we actually applied to the Ontario Trillium Foundation for their um, Community Resilience Fund. Um, and we're hoping that we are successful in getting a grant from them to be able to continue the development and the curation of the resources and to keep the roadmap alive. And then lastly, as I said, while it's been customized for Ottawa, it's really applicable nationally. Um, there's, there's all sorts of information from the national level to the provincial level to the local and municipal level. And um, it's definitely something that, you know, even though we have developed things only for Ottawa, taking out the word Ottawa and sticking in your municipality, they equally apply. So the next steps. Um, one of the things that we want to do is we want to actually run a strategic planning session in light of COVID. So last year we actually ran as part of our sports summit a strategic planning session for community sport organizations in Ottawa. And um, while a lot of the, the principles still apply about that, um, there are specific principles that are going to apply because of COVID. So we want to redo that with our members to help them figure out what their strategic plan should be for the next year to, as I said, not only survive but to thrive in this, um, this area. In terms of resources, we really want to develop resources in five key areas. Um, we want to come out with some sort of sustainability resource that can help our organizations get through this and survive getting through all of this from a financial perspective. Um, we want to help them with their communications and help them with their risk management. Also, volunteer recruitment's become really challenging. It's become challenging because of physical distancing requirements. It's also become challenging because of fear of, about health and safety. So how does one go about recruiting volunteers in the COVID era? And then lastly, health and safety. What are the new guidelines we have to be following? 
We're planning on running a couple of webinars. One is specifically on how to use the roadmap. And then the other one is we're planning on running a webinar about writing the OTF Community Resilience Fund Grant. Um, there's another intake on December the 2nd. So we're planning on um, write, uh, developing a webinar that would take our members through um, that process um, to help them with their applications to um, give them as much of a leg up as possible to um, be successful in getting their funding. So that's basically what I was going to talk to you about. I was hoping, um, you know, what I would do was generate some thoughts and questions in your mind about what we did and, you know, how it might apply to your organizations. And so I open the floor now. We'd love some feedback from you guys. We know we have a couple organizations in here. Uh, maybe you guys could just talk about uh, oh, David. Hi, I just, um, uh, David is on the Mariposa School of Skating in uh, Barrie, well, obviously. Um, just as, as an organization at Ottawa Sports Council, uh, you had mentioned um, uh, in your next phase for return to play, uh, you needed uh, resources for higher engagement. Um, you were um, hoping to get a trillion fund grant, but, but where, where does your money come from? Are you, are you a government funded organization? So we, very interesting question. We actually get some funding from the city of Ottawa um, as a base organization. And we, the Ottawa Sport Council came into existence in 2013 and our, um, our funding was tied to helping the city develop their municipal sports strategy. And so that has been a five, six, seven year project. And we get a certain amount of funding each year from the city to be working on that with them and a little bit of core funding. Mm -hmm. Predominantly, the rest of our funding that's program based comes from different granting organizations. So we, um, we've been very successful with a lot of Trillium Foundation grants. We've been successful with Canada Summer Jobs. We've been successful when the Ontario government had their Ontario Sport and Community Recreation Fund grants. So we're like very many of our members. Um, you know, we don't charge a membership fee. Our view is that all of our members are already giving their time and attention and volunteer time. So why are we charging them a fee to help them out? And that was that was a, um, a very lengthy conversation that we had to have with the city of Ottawa because the city kept coming to us saying, well, you know, you could, you could raise money and be funded by memberships. And we said, but why are we charging these people who are already giving their time? So it was a, it was a, a conversation that they listened to and they've been very supportive of us. And, and in turn, we have been very supportive of them. So all of this work for the return to play roadmap, um, we've had two city people um, as part of our leadership group. And they have commented on the streamlining that we have done to help make their job easier. So, you know, we have taken a big load off of their shoulders in fielding all of the questions, concerns, comments, and helping the sector return where the city of Ottawa no longer has to do that. So it, it's, it's, I'm not gonna say we're an extension of the city of Ottawa because we aren't whatsoever. Our role is to support community sport, but in doing so, we offload a lot of the headaches, um, whatever that the city would have to go through in dealing with these organizations. So it becomes a win-win for both of us. Well, and I think it's a, a great opportunity for a community like Ottawa because there's many communities even smaller that have um, sport organizations that are floundering um, through this pandemic and they don't have, um, they're, they're a small cog in the wheel. And uh, if they had a, a council like they have, you have in Ottawa um, to bring together all these different organizations and be the voice, I think uh, it's incredible what you're doing. Well, the other interesting thing is um, highlighting things in a, in a, obviously a positive way. So right now we're the, we're having a huge, huge issue with basketball and volleyball because I'm not too sure about in Barrie, but 95% of our basketball and volleyball facilities are school board. And so the school boards aren't letting anybody in. 
And so where hockey is able to return to play and where soccer is able to return to play and where swimming is able to return to play, basketball and volleyball can't because they don't have a facility to play in. And, and when you look at the, obviously the rise of basketball within Canada and you look at how um, basketball appeals um, to our newcomers and basketball is a way to integrate those people into the community. Exactly what I said at the beginning about inclusivity. You know, it's a sport that we, we can't ignore. We can't just say we don't have facilities. So we are working with the basketball associations and we're working with the city to say, okay, we have some gyms in some gym facilities within the city. What can we do about supporting them? So again, so most of our basketball associations are run by volunteers. So they don't have the time during the day to go to a bunch of different meetings. So that's definitely one area that we've been able to help with advocacy and, and to say, you know, we all want the same thing within the city. So how can we do this? And if we can be that voice to help them out, as you said, what it does is it allows us to kind of bring all the basketball voices together to talk as one, which definitely makes the sport a stronger sport. It's a great answer, Marcia. Great answer. Does anybody else have any questions, feedback um, on the topics, on the return to play roadmap, um, on any struggles they've been having as an organization on returning to play? I know we have a couple other organizations in the participant box here. Um, Marcia would be happy to answer any, any questions you guys have. Hey, Matt. I just had a question. Oh, Pam. Pam's got a question here. I was actually just wondering, Marcia, once you gathered up all of the content, how did you communicate it out? What was available? Like, was it e-newsletters to a broadcast or? Yeah, so we have an email list and we did broadcast it out. We use social media. Um, we use the we use a lot of CERC. I don't know if you're aware of the Sport Information Resource Center, um, CERC.ca. So they have a national news board. Um, and we've, we've found that uh, many, many of our members subscribe to CERC. Um, that might be because they're based in Ottawa, so people know about them. I, I actually don't know how community people across Canada use CERC. I, I definitely know at the national level. I'm also very... Um, blessed in a non-COVID time that I'm resident. Um, my office is actually in um, a, a shared office space within Ottawa called the House of Sport and there's 27 different sport organizations. I'm the only community sport organizations. They're mostly the national ones. So Coaching Association of Canada, Taekwondo Canada, Ring at Canada, Ultimate Canada, you know, many different organizations. And so um, I have that network as well that I put it out to. Um, but I have to say it's a challenge because we don't have a dedicated communications person and it's something that we have identified that we have to figure out how to get our messaging out there better for everybody who knows about it they found it very very useful but getting other people knowing about it when this isn't their day job is much more difficult great question pam i can kind of add to that question did you have difficulty with kind of the shifting landscape of COVID with updating the information? And did you deal with, with much negative feedback from, you know, maybe misinformation from any parties? Or that? You know what? Um, it's the one thing that we've, we've had no negative feedback. We've actually had um, overwhelmingly positive feedback people who said, oh my goodness, I just didn't know where to get the information. And thank you very much for making it easy for me. Um, in terms of the shifting information, um, I would say that at least one day a week for me is spent on the roadmap. Okay, this is a new piece of information in. Um, the, the beauty of it was what we decided to do, although you launched the roadmap from our website, um, technically you actually go to a different website. And that different website is based on a Wix pop platform. My website's based on a WordPress platform. Mm -hmm. Wix is really easy to deal with. The reason that we drove it off of the Ottawa Sport Council website was because we really felt that it had to be representative of the 70 organizations. We, we look at ourselves as the steward of it, but we don't look at ourselves as the owner of it. The owner of it is the community. So we really felt that it needed to have its own place to live and breathe. In doing that, our designer who helped us with it 
um, you know, kind of introduced us to Wix, which as a development tool is very easy. So um, my, my ease of updating, um, as long as somebody gives me links, it's quite easy to update. But I probably get, I would say five to 10 emails every week of new resources. I've got to go through them to make sure that they are applicable. In some cases they aren't. Um, make sure that they are applicable and if they are, add them into the roadmap. And as I said, if things have come along that supersede, um, get rid of the things that are superseding. The one question that we always have that you probably have in Barry is, you know, who trumps who? So um, you've got information coming down from your NSO, you've got information coming down from your provincial sporting organization, you've got information from public health, and you've got information from your municipality. So if those conflict, what do you do? And, you know, the answer is really easy. You've got to go with the most cautious one. So if your national sporting organization is saying that you can have X number of people, but your municipality is saying, no, no, you can't, you can only have this many, you go with what your municipality is saying. So that's a message that we've had to get out there is that, you know, although this is on the roadmap, you have to, you as a community sport organization, unfortunately, you're in the unenviable position of having to marry all of those different requirements and bring them all together. And, and you have to um, be the, the steward of that. So as a result of it, you have to follow the most cautious approach. Right. I think, I think David has a question over here. Yeah. I, I, I was just uh, going to pick up on what Pam said uh, with the change in landscape. Uh, but you kind of got into it, Marcia. Our, our, um, for, for us to open in, in Barrie in, in June, uh, we, we worked hard with the municipality, the city of Barrie, uh, and they were great. But we quickly, quickly realized that the people that had the keys to the kingdom were the uh, district health unit, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so it should be. Um, and uh, once we've gone through different things, like there was a point in the summer where we're really um, lobbying district health unit saying that uh, we could open up safely. Our PSO did a great job in uh, developing the protocols protocols um, that we had to adhere to. Uh, we shared that document and they finally signed off on it. But through um, the ensuing months into July, August, and now September, we were, now we're in a situation where um, the city, the municipality and district health unit is allowing us to have more skaters on the ice, but our PSO is limiting us uh, as to how many skaters we have. Again, we're fine with that. Um, we'd like to have more, um, but I think one of the successes skating has had is because there has been a cautious approach to how we get our skaters and coaches back on the ice. That's just our experience. But the keys to the kingdom belong to the district health unit. So what we found, a couple of things that you've just said. The first was um, we've really worked. So not only on our return to play leadership group, we have the city. We also have Ottawa Public Health. And we have worked as a, as a trio. So Ottawa Public Health did a, re um, a, a return to play webinar. Um, they've done it for all different sectors. So they did it from the sports sector and we were involved with it. They just come back to us to say, okay, we've received some issues about, you know, spectators being side by side and what can we do and how can we support the sports sector better. So we're actually hosting a, a leadership group meeting and bringing in Ottawa Public Health um, as, a, as a guest so that Ottawa Public Health, we're using them as a focus group, the, um, the, the leadership group, so that they can provide Ottawa Public Health with advice because at the end of the day, Ottawa Public Health doesn't want to say, no, you can't do it. They want to make sure everything's safe. So we're providing that liaison. Interestingly, what you said about, you know, what your PSO said. So that was one of the other benefits of working together as, a, as an entire city. So we, um, we have Canoe Kayak, who's on one body of water, and Rowing, who's on another body of water. And Canoe Kayak wanted to go back to two people in a boat, and they couldn't convince their PSO to do that. Um, I, we had a big conversation because there's a canoe kite person and a rowing person on our leadership group. And so we kind of got together with Ottawa Public Health and rowing was in doubles. 
So we talked about what they did to convince their PSO to be in doubles. And we talked to Ottawa Public Health and we basically gave the Canoe Kayak Club, Ottawa Canoe and Kayak, the ability to be able to, and the data to be able to go back to their PSO to say, okay, this is what we wanna do and why. And their PSO has given them the opportunity to do that. So learning from each other has been really key. We found, you know, water sports learn from each other. We found diving and swimming learning from each other. We found soccer and ultimate learning from each other. Um, so it's, and, and not only learning about return to play, but now we're finding that it's going farther. We're finding that it's, okay, what are you doing about your sustainability model? So even that dialogue that's been generated at that peer level has been extraordinarily valuable. On, on the note of the peer level, um, you know, when we end this, I have absolutely no issues if um, Matt shares my contact details with all of you. Um, very, very happy to help out. Very, very to help, happy to um, point you in the right direction with somebody that we've done something with or, or in every way I can. Um, at the end of the day, the sooner we get all of community sport back is better. It's not just, as I said, about Ottawa, it's community sport across the country. Um, really hoping that, you know, as a sector, we can raise our voices loud enough that there is some sort of funding available um, at a higher level, because it, I, I very much worry about, if not, not what's going to happen to the people who can afford to play right now, but what's going to happen to all of those people who were struggling to afford to play before COVID hit. And now we're seeing them sitting on the sidelines and will they even be able to get back? And that's not what sports should be about. So how do we make it more inclusive for all? How do we make sure that at that participant level we're supporting them so that they can afford to return to play? Well, thank you so much, Marcia. I, I will definitely share the contact information with everyone yeah. in the group and everyone in the invitation list for sure. Um, David, did you raise your hand again or you just Oh, yeah, I have one, and it is probably a loaded question. Um, uh, as an organization like yours, uh, representing many sport organizations in your community, do you have any conversations with the, um, the school boards there? Because one of our one of our fears is uh, all, all of, a majority of our clientele are are in school. Many of the uh, more of the elite athletes are choosing to do the online thing because they don't want to have to quarantine for 14 days in this training and whatever. But uh, um, that's it's a real concern for us. We've got these kids going back to school, and then at night they're coming to the rinks or pools or gyms or whatever. Um, that's a little frightening. And so what we've encouraged our members to do is to make sure that they're filling out that two things. The number one thing is um, the, the daily health questionnaire that everybody's supposed to be filling out before they show up. And the number two is the contact tracing so that you can get it back. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's all about risk and it's all about how to mitigate your risk. And the more that you can mitigate your risk and the more that you can manage your risk, um, the more you can continue on with the programming that you're doing. Um, we, have, we have tried to have, I mean, the, the sports school division exists in everything, right? Like we, we just finished a very successful concussion education initiative that if you are interested in concussions, we just um, posted our video of the education that we put together. Um, and we, we tried to engage the schools in that. Um, if you look at Rowan's Law and you look at how Rowan's Law has, you know, specific regulations for sport organizations, but nowhere does it say that it should be talking to the schools about what their athletes are doing in schools. And if you understand why Rowan's Law came into being, it was because Rowan Stringer participated both in club rugby and in school rugby and, and one didn't know what the other was doing. So that, that disconnect between school and sport, unfortunately, I think exists in the COVID era as well. And what we try to do is encourage our members to be as prudent as they possibly can be um, and mitigate the risk as much as they can because they really can't control what's happening. Great point, Marcia. Does anybody else have any any questions to run by run by Marcia? I know we have a couple other members of the community uh, with us tonight. Oh, 
Okay. Well, you can always you can always send uh, myself an email, and I can forward you on Marcy's contact information, or I can attempt to answer it myself with any questions you may have um, moving forward. Um, I think we I think that is it for questions here. So I guess uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, it was a great session, Marcia. That was a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone took a lot of uh, good points from, from you tonight. Uh, just a reminder for everyone here, our uh, last session is next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, it's with Brent Barut, who is a sponsorship specialist. And it's about understanding corporate sponsorship and everything around sponsorship. Uh, he's a really dynamic speaker, so we, uh, we really encourage everybody to attend. And if you could get anybody in, in your organization interested as well, just forward them the Zoom link and they can hop on the call. Um, and I think that is it for me. So I think we'll end it there. It's a bit early, but uh, thanks again, everyone, for, for attending. We'll see, you, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.